So wild monitor lizards, they've often got ticks on them, but because they're, they're quite disgusting really, I've never really bothered with them. And then a few weeks ago, I was looking at a photo used by an adult savannah monitor lizard, Baronis exanthematicus, and I saw these ticks hanging about at the entrance. And although I must have seen thousands of ticks on the lizards, I've never actually seen them detached from the host before. So they're quite nondescript, they haven't got colourful enamel like the ones I'm used to seeing. And often when I show pictures of wild animals, savannah monitors to pet keepers, they're like, ooh, why don't you take the ticks off? But we, we try not to interfere really with stuff unless it's unavoidable. But these loose ticks that we found got me curious about ticks, and when I get curious about any aspects of monitor lizard ecology, it first stops usually Walter Offenberg's trilogy on Varanus komodoensis, Varanus olivaceus, and Varanus bengalensis. And if you only ever read one book about monitor lizards in your life, it should probably be the Bengal. It should definitely be the bengalensis book. And in there, there's a rather extensive section on exoparasites, which also refers to an earlier work by Offenberg and his son Troy. And the information in those two accounts is largely what the following is based on. But I'm going to use Savannah Monitor as a sort of novel example. So ticks, they're arachnids, you know, like spiders. And, and most monitor lizard ticks are specialised monitor lizard parasites which means that they're, they're not exclusively found on monitor lizards, but they nearly always are, if that makes sense. So they've got a four-stage life cycle. There's an egg, a larva, a nymph, and an adult. And they shed the skins twice between the larval and the nymph stage and the nymph to the adult stage. And they require three hosts because the tick has to detach itself from the lizard every time it sheds its skin. So presumably the ticks molt and they lay eggs in the lizard burrows because otherwise they'd have pretty much no chance of finding another monitor lizard. Well, we hardly know anything about the larval stage. They seem rarer than you'd expect. You'd sort of expect them to be most babies and then the least adults, but we don't find a lot of larval ticks on lizards and I don't think other people have either. So maybe they feed and detach very quickly. And the larvae have only got six legs, while the older stage they've got eight. And as far as I know, you can't tell the difference between the male and female larvae and the nymphs. But as adults, the males are covered in enamel. They've got these quite nice bright markings on them. And the females have only got a little bit of enamel on the, I suppose it's the thorax, isn't it? Or the equivalent. which And that lets the abdomen swell horribly, really, to get the most number of eggs into it. So, I've always thought of ticks as blood-sucking animals, but the Offenberg suggests that it's only the female ticks that drink blood, and the males are feeding on hemolymph and fluid from damaged cells. And that would be why the female ticks are found in the auxiliary region, the armpits, leg pits, basically, around there, where the skin's thin, and the males are clustered. And he, in this example of uh, Varanus neuroticus, they're clustered at the tail base. And the males might benefit from congregating like that because they create more of an immune reaction and they increase the amount of ruptured cells that they can drink from. Um, the scales are typically left scarred, and in some populations of monitor lizards, this kind of scarring is really extensive. So this one is typical of water monitors from Paleo Isle, from the forests of Paleo in the Philippines. And um, it's probably the reason why this population was never targeted by leather trade in the days when lizard skin was big business in the Philippines. Because it basically completely destroys the hide, those holes. And it's a common problem in the leather market is that the bigger the skins, obviously the better they are for making handbags and this, that and the other, but also the bigger the skins, the more chance there is that they're going to have holes in them, which are caused by ticks. Uh, ticks are also attracted to the edges of injured areas, and they tend to make the damage a bit worse. So ticks, all ticks, I think, mate on the host. They don't drop off and mate, they mate on the host animal. And In the case of monitor lizards, the males seem to move from their normal attachment sites up to the armpits, leg pits, when the females become receptive. But it isn't clear why you don't get crowds of males around receptive females. There only ever seems to be one making the trip at a time. 
So once females mates and she's had enough to eat, then she drops off the lizard and she lays her eggs and she dies and the eggs hatch and the cycle starts again. The adult males probably stay on the host until we die waiting for more females to attach. But we don't know how long it takes Marsh lizard ticks to complete each feeding stage, but it's probably days or weeks rather than months because recaptured animals, even like just a week apart, ten days apart, tend to have very different numbers of ticks. Young savannah monitors don't have any ticks at all, we don't find them at all, and that's probably because they spend the first few months of their life in the burrows of this giant cricket, Brachy Troopies, and they're not visiting the burrows that are used by adults, which we presume now are the tick reservoirs. And by about September, when the, the baby's like six, seven months old, most of them are too big to fit down the cricket burrows, at that stage we start to find ticks on them. So, in Varanus ex anthematicus, there's two easily distinguished ticks in this population, at least. And the taxonomy isn't reliable enough to be certain of their actual names. So, species one, the males are living in clusters at the tail base, and the females are in the armpit, leg pit regions, or between the toes. And the males cause this quite extensive scarring, which actually makes me wonder if it might be possible to estimate the age of animals based on the amount of scarring present which would take a lot of doing but anyway in species two the males are clustered in the ears and the nostrils sometimes around the eyes and these males don't seem to cause the same extensive scarring as species one does at the tail pace so maybe they're not maybe they've got a different feeding strategy and they're not sort of rupturing cells and drinking hemolymph the same as species one but nevertheless they're very tightly clustered and they show very site specific attachment the females of both species are more scattered, and I think both they're either between the toes is it, or in the auxiliary region. And we've not seen very many engorged females at all, and only one with an attendant male. And that's maybe because ticks don't need to be attached very long, you know, for these males. It might be that ticks that have dropped off to moles also have to wait for a long time in burrows for another monitor lizard to visit. So that's based on our experience, which it suggests firstly that individual savannah monitors rarely use a hole for more than a couple of days at a time, and they don't come back to it for months, but also that savannah monitors are very strongly attracted to burrows that have been used by other savannah monitors. They don't really like, except for the brachytropes burrows that the juveniles use, adult lizards really don't like going into holes that haven't been used previously by monitor lizards. So monitor burrow, adult monitor lizard burrows tend to be a shared resource and if this is the case we'd probably expect to find a lot of ticks in the lizard burrows. I mean, we've dug thousands of lizard burrows and we haven't found any ticks except the ones at the beginning of this video. And that's probably because we don't dig very carefully and we lose all sorts of valuable clues from the surface of the burrows. So. If we used a battery powered vacuum cleaner or something like that to suck up stuff from the walls and the floor and the ceiling of the burrows, we might learn a lot more. That's something for the next generation of researchers to consider, I suppose, if we don't get around to it. Right, so one of the mysteries of savannah monitors, for me at least, is why we regularly find adults on the branches of trees during the starvation period, which is January to June, but we never find them in trees from July to December. So during the starvation season, the adult lizards seem to shuttle between the branches of a tree and a burrow that's almost always under the shade of that same tree. And it kind of seems counterintuitive that a lizard without access to water would choose to increase its evaporative water loss by hanging out in places that would be great for drying the laundry. So me one week spent reading about the perverse world of ticks has made me wonder if perhaps the ticks get so bad during the dry season and the early part of the wet season when the animals are starving that the lizards can reduce the number of ectoparasites by avoiding burrows as much as possible and staying in a rather dry environment that isn't necessarily good for ticks which ticks generally die, dehydrate quite quickly. Savannah monitors don't dehydrate quickly no matter what you might have read on Facebook groups to the contrary so my new hypothesis anyway is that 
tick loads in burrows and on the animals are greater during the fasting season and the lizards ameliorate that by hanging themselves out like washing to dry the ticks out. Well, it sounds a bit daft, but if we get the chance, we'll try and test it over the next year. The problem, really, with this is explaining why these king lizards are in the trees, you know, at this time of year when they're not there any other time. So if you've got a better idea, let's hear about it. So, ticks. Ticks aren't dangerous because they feed on animals, but because they transmit awful bacteria and protozoan and viral diseases. Lyme disease is probably the best known example, but there's all types that are transmitted by ticks. And because of this, there's quite tight controls in a lot of countries to make sure that birds and mammals traded over international borders are tick-free. But nobody's ever bothered with reptile ticks. And we know that reptile ticks, including some monitor lizard ticks, can carry a range of potentially very nasty diseases, including some that are fatal to dogs or potentially dangerous to people. Certainly, they carry a lot of diseases that are bad for lizards that are probably quite important in the dynamics of populations and how populations sort of grow and shrink, but we don't know anything about that. We do know that in international wildlife trade, Ticks from all over the world get spread through captive populations, so you get tortoise ticks from one continent end up on snakes from another continent, and all mixed up like that. And in areas like Florida, where exotic pets can escape and establish themselves, there's a real danger that the ticks that accompany them could also become established. And chances are that your local pet shop doesn't know anything about ticks except how to remove them, and even that might be too much trouble for them. So don't be surprised if you find ticks on captive bred monish lizards because uh, you're dealing with a trade that really doesn't give a flying fuck. So I hope you've learned something from my video and I'll put a list of relevant references in the description. And if you're here because you keep some animal monish lizards, please think for yourselves and don't be duped by crap on the internet. Thank you very much.